And what I'd like to share with you is um, computational forensics. This is a field I'm working on officially with the title for more than 10 years, inofficially. The term was just not born, I think, more than 20 years. Using machine learning, pattern recognition, computational uh, intelligence to advance forensic sciences. First, physical evidence, documents, handwriting, banknotes, passports, now the last 10 years, uh, digital evidence. Alternative title, artificial intelligence, in digital forensics, what is behind the bus. And I'm saying this a little bit provocative because currently there are so many talks about artificial intelligence uh, out there that I'm getting sometimes really unease on what is promised and what expectations are raised. And uh, in my presentation, I would like to take the chance to give you a little bit more uh, deeper insight. So I assume that 50% working already with this, but I also assume that the other 50% are a little bit scared on what is coming next. So keynote is usually teach us something and uh, show us something exciting. So I hope I push all buttons. So there is Norway. Uh, this we have been, we are with NTNU. NTNU is a technology university. 33% 30, uh, are natural sciences and technology, which is quite unusual for university. Uh, this is the number of students. If you are, uh, think, however, that Norway is a very industrialized country, uh, mainly benefiting from oil and gas shipping industry, uh, and providing a lot of manufacturing. Uh, for instance, uh, German car automotive industry buys in great extent in Norway. Then you may understand uh, why Norway has so much education and research also in technology. And then of course, given the distances in Norway, digitalization, everything is automized, communication technology has a long tradition. What are we doing? So digitalization is also a bus. Everybody talks about it. Um, and what we see is that there are great forecasts and promises of the impact of digitalization. 10%, uh, for instance, in, uh, increase in, in uh, the digitalization uh, lead to out oh, of 75% uh, in forecast in growth of uh, 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 growth of the domestic product for Norway. And at the same time, there are enormous losses due to uh, cyber incidents. And for Norway, only the reported numbers is a, a, a approximately the same size. So we have to do something. And this is the mission that we have been set out, supporting digitalization and making it better secure in critical infrastructures, uh, in health, in finance, and also protecting national security and defense. Uh, we are uh, affiliated with the Department uh, of Communication Technology and Information Security. Uh, it's 80 full-time employees uh, and about 130 warm bodies. If you compare to other universities where you have an, a digital forensics or computer science department, it's hardly at its size. And we are communication and uh, information security only. We support two master programs, two PhD programs, and 45% uh, uh, of our budget in the department comes uh, from external. And then, of course, uh, research activities active uh, in uh, communities like uh, OISORIX, which is also quite famous information security conference, which was held in Oslo last year. We realized that it's not enough to be among academics also, so we established close collaboration uh, with public and private sector, and we established the uh, Center for Cyber and Information Security. 
which has now uh, 26 partners who are all actively contributing financially to the research and education in the center. And then, of course, thematically, our research is organized into groups, typical academic groups, but, uh, for instance, in our group, there are also uh, COPs, now I say special investigators from the high-tech crime unit or economic crime unit in Norway, uh, active members. The model for this, and here the uh, credit uh, for two center originally established uh, between UCD in Ireland and France. We wanted to become a member. It was, was not possible since we were only Norway associated members. We liked the model, uh, we support the model, and when we were, got the no-go from uh, European Commission, we, uh, the police commissioner of Norway said, if Europe does not pay us, we do it ourselves. And he funded uh, three professorships over 10 years, which was the kickoff to run uh, the digital forensics group in this great extent and with the resources we have today. And as you see, the topics are traditional digital forensics topics, but already in 2013, the strategic decision was taken to support machine learning uh, and computational intelligence to support forensic sciences. The group are today uh, about 26 members. Uh, we have still positions to fill. Uh, and we are quite active in different uh, domains. I will elaborate uh, later on. Uh, our focus is on technology, uh, digital forensics from uh, mobile embedded devices up to computing algorithms and co uh, algorithm reliability. Funding, of course, is important. Uh, I would like to uh, particularly point out a joint uh, educational program with university, uh, Police University College which is uh, uh, in collaboration uh, or inspired by UCD educating uh, uh, police officers uh, in their uh, primary educations. This is the team, and I put in particular the second one. There are two pictures or two faces you should have been recognizing if you attended yesterday. Uh, in the last row is sitting Jens Petter and Gunnar, who have given their presentation yesterday, both on uh, embedded devices. On education, we uh, have the full range of education uh, from bachelor, master and PhD level. And as I said, in cooperation with Police Academy, also uh, lower levels for retraining uh, police personnel to deal with digital evidence. Teaching is important. Uh, research is fun. Um, research agenda to warm up computational forensics, which I will elaborate uh, in detail today. Uh, cloud, uh, and, uh, cloud forensic cybercrime is investigation, so two of our team members will be uh, for digital forensics research workshop in the US and present their work there. Economic crime investigation, of course, crime happens where the money is, so this is important. And more and more mobile and embedded devices, I just mentioned uh, the work from Jens Petter and Gunnar. We are technologists, but of course we have close collaborations also with people with a legal background and uh, informa uh, in, uh, information security management. For example, uh, uh, we work closely on a project with Fabrizio uh, and Mariangela in Essential to educate uh, technologists on legal personnel in, in uh, Marie Curie Trainings Network Essential. Large-scale investigation uh, from a technical perspective uh, meet us uh, more and more. We have increasingly large amount of data uh, that needs to be analyzed. It's widely distributed, uh, need to be enriched from open sources from internet uh, or from darknet. 
Uh, if there are, for instance, investigations, uh, it will be also mobile devices, computers, whatever can be found. Or in the case of economic crime, there are also traditional paper documents. So in order to deal with the uh, massive amount of data, human capacity is simply not possible anymore. We have to bring in computing support in order to deal with the amount. And everybody who uh, works, uh, I usually say, in the basement knows tight operational times are always there. Cases need to be pushed out quickly, so any uh, let's say machinery support uh, is highly appreciated. The question is how can we apply those methods in the most sensible way without um, manipulating or falsifying evidence. I would like to remind you that uh, when we are talking about large-scale uh, investigations, uh, we differentiate between two fundamental types. One type is it's found, for instance, in a regional police district where we have the typical child, now I say typical, but where we have child exploitation, where we have drug abuse, uh, robbery, uh, murder, and so on. Usually there are a smaller amount of, uh, uh, or comparable smaller amount of uh, data to be analyzed, but the number of cases uh, and the cross analysis between cases uh, uh, contributes to a more and more increasing amount uh, that needs to be handled. On the other hand, we are talking about large scale uh, investigations as they usually occur in economic crime investigations. Uh, where a single case uh, ends up in terabyte uh, of uh, data uh, that needs to be only one case uh, uh, to be analyzed and where the cases usually take years, at least one year and more. Examples for this and what is public uh, is, for instance, Enron, Emil Corpus, I think everybody knows in the room, uh, where 160 gigabyte uh, uh, became publicly available after the investigation of, uh, of the company, uh, which ends up uh, to 107 million email messages, which is originally real-world email communication in the company. The other amount of data uh, as an example, which is also very known, are the Panama Papers. It was in the press everywhere, uh, which ends up to 111 million documents that are 2.6 terabyte of data. And only to analyzing those data, huge human effort, 376 journalists have been working. And I don't think they went uh, through to all of this. So I think there is not needed more any motivation that something needs to be done and that we cannot do it manually any longer. Comparison, these are previous leakage uh, uh, from cases, um, WikiLeaks, for example, versus Panama Papers. Uh, I was happy to find some international case studies, uh, how can we specify uh, case numbers. Normal cases have, uh, for example, around uh, 100,000 documents, large cases up to 1 million, very large cases 100 million, and <laughs> they call it ridiculous cases indeed. Um, these are uh, more than 100 million. Ouch. What to do with this? An eco cream was so nice to give us some real numbers. Their largest case t currently is 20 times larger than Panama paper, around 220 million uh, uh, documents that end up to 52 terabyte of data. How can we handle this? and how to can we handle it correctly. 
And remember, it's not only economic crime that produces so much data uh, in the Internet of Everything, at, uh, as, it's, uh, at, as we say today. We have electronic data, digital data, and uh, all types uh, of uh, systems, tra traditional um, uh, scatter system, industrial systems, uh, EcoCream, for example, uh, is also responsible for environmental crime and, and uh, investigates the fish farms in Norway. So the lax that you eat in Italy comes most likely from Norway. And uh, there's a huge fraud, uh, insurance fraud, for instance, by uh, trying to cash in funding from the insurances for fish that is lost. But surprisingly, the fish machines, uh, the feeding machines have been working. And there are proprietary systems that produce data that need to be analyzed and need to be, for instance, cross-correlated with um, uh, the buying uh, of fish food and the invoices of this. So, computational forensics. How do can we tackle it? First of all, I would like, this is now the teacher in me, I would like to make a, a clear statement my definition and the difference between forensics and criminology. Forensic sciences are based on the natural sciences, uh, which apply different methods from the different discipline in order to uh, identify artifacts, analyze them and provide evidence in order to reconstruct what has happened. In forensic sciences, we do not develop theories uh, about crimes. It's only fact, purely fact-based. Criminology, on the other hand, studies uh, crime as a, a um, sociology, uh, from, uh, with a background from sociology in the social sciences. And they have hypotheses and theories, what is the cause for crime, how it can prevent it, uh, how does it spread and so on. In everything what we are doing so far, we are staying fact-based, funded in natural sciences, forensic sciences. Oh, there was the wrong button. And everybody knows, uh, I think in this room, uh, what forensic sciences is, but I highlighted some words, uh, and this is Within the objective to investigate and reconstruct, we need to collect and analyze trace evidence. And then we are doing identify, classify, quantify, individualize. If someone who has never heard about machine learning pattern recognition may say, of course, this is what we do. When I saw this the first time, I said, oh, perfect. I'm from machine learning pattern recognition. This is what we have the algorithm for. So the question is, is this what uh, forensic experts usually do? Can we automate it or semi-automate it at least? What are the challenges? Of course, tiny pieces of evidence, chaotic environment. We have to deal with uh, incompleteness, um, we are looking at abnormalities, uh, specific properties. This all what normal, traditional, mainstream pattern recognition machine learning is not doing. For instance, if I try to predict this book, uh, people who read this book also read the other book. This was not what we are interested in, right? We are looking for this one person who has this very strange interests for instance, in reading books, and we are not interested in all the others who do the same. And by dealing with those uh, particularities, as I say it in forensics, we have to be objective, we need to be robust and reproducible. So Monday is the same uh, decision as Fridays, also for our algorithms. So our motivation when we're talking about computational forensics is to assist basic and applied research, to establish and prove a scientific base for forensic disciplines. 
And some of you may hear it ringing. Yes, we work towards supporting Daubot criteria, fulfillment. And then, of course, if we have a scientific basis, then we can assist a forensic expert in the daily case work. And we do not want to replace forensics experts, some, uh, but like to have an uh, inter cooperation between human and machine. Computational methods out there, long studied uh, in this field of computing sciences, but how can we bring them efficiently and reliably in the forensic domain? So, we would like to define uh, computational forensics as an in-deep understanding of a forensic discipline, evaluate the method basis, and provide a systematic approach. In general, we apply modeling, simulation, analysis, and recognition. In differentiation, please remember computational forensics can deal with any type of evidence. It can support the traditional uh, disciplines, chemistry, biology, whereas computer forensic deals with digital evidence. And here and now we want to apply computational methods to digital evidence. And now you tell me, Katrin, don't you know there are all these cool tools out there already? Why do you bother? Well, yes, there are a lot of tools out there. There are a lot of companies developing new software to support forensic casework. Do you know what's in the box? Do you know when it works and when not? Can you explain it to the judge and the jury in a court of law? My point is, if we like to more and more apply computational methods, we truly need to understand it. And there need to be forensics experts who know the insight and who can challenge. Because a computer may be a new witness in the courtroom and may be challenged like any other expert witness. But for this, we need to understand what's under the hood. In this list uh, from Gartner, there are three tools not mentioned, but I like to mention here. Squirrel, Hanskin, and Palantir. Those are currently the uh, hot tools. I'm not going to talk about tools. My focus is on algorithms. And for everybody who has not been working with algorithms, Let's look how machines learn and how machines identify. Machine Learning Pattern Recognition 101. First, machine learning pattern recognition are very old disciplines uh, developed independently in engineering and computer science. Engineers try to define patterns, for instance, for quality control in production processes. Computer scientists try to create a machine that can learn like human and can behave like human. At the end and over the last two, 20 years, both disciplines merged. And around uh, 10 years ago, businesses picked up and uh, coined the term predictive analytics. More or less, you want to challenge me? <laughs> Maybe even earlier. Um, uh, more or less, uh, the technologies that are behind uh, are similar. The purpose are a little bit different. The primary goal uh, is to perform classification either learning by example or without examples, and uh, to uh, establish small intra-class variations of those patterns and large intra-class variations. Simple methods, and this is really 101, uh, in supervised learning at the time of system design, uh, we need to define the classes, we need to describe the classes, 
that are then later being used uh, to uh, allow us to, um, for instance, um, match uh, pattern characteristics. And those classes are mathematical models, formulas uh, or similar. In unsupervised learning, we just look at characteristics and I usually say compared to playing puzzle, you start up uh, finding the corner pieces, the edge pieces, uh, and then you go and go about and sort a color. Similar, it's done in unsupervised learning. Machines learn by, ex, uh, by example. So any machine uh, now is more or less as good as it has been trained, either by a human operator giving him a description of pattern structured uh, rules, or patterns have been presented and the machine uh, adopted their own parameters. And I usually compare this, uh, if you remember an old uh, radio receiver with NF, you were turning the buttons in order to receive um, uh, the carrier wave. This is approximately the same idea where we uh, attune parameters in order to uh, capture some patterns that are of same characteristics. Machine learning is a well-defined task. It has an uh, objective. Um, it learns from experience and there is a performance measure on how good the task is being solved. And usually it's done in iterations. Several presentations of patterns uh, need to be performed in order to tune the parameters. In order for machines, we need to represent the real world into a machine understandable way. And there the challenge kicks in. We need to describe uh, our phenomenon uh, with, for, for example, numerical par uh, parameters. And now the question is, you the main experts, how do we uh, describe malicious malware behavior or malware behavior in numerical terms so that a machine can learn malicious behavior of malware. So, the good news is, even if there is intelligence machines out there and artificial intelligence, domain experts, forensics experts, malware experts, are still in urgent need in order to prepare those or describe those phenomena. Don't answer me now, but now we have deep learning. You don't need this anymore. I will tell you we still need it. And in particular, if you need to go to the judge, you cannot bring your deep neural network with you. How do you explain? So, forensics expertise and need in cooperation so that we can make machine learn. And then the challenge is, how many parameters do I need in order to describe malware behavior? How many uh, parameters do I need in order to describe uh, package int uh, uh, interception, uh, for instance, or for intrusion detection systems? What is it? And there's a simple mass task Do you know the solution for this problem? Maybe you listen? Thank you. Numerical parameters help us to describe. And depending on how many numerical parameters we have, the more classes we can differentiate. For example, if you only have two parameters or one parameter, you can only differentiate in one class. You cannot differentiate in 10 malware families. You need a little bit more. So the crux for successful machine learning is the description of the phenomenon with parameters. 
How many? The answer, it depends. The right ones. But what are the right ones? It depends from the task. So the take home message for me is, everybody can solve these little examples on toy, the toy examples manually by themselves. And then think about how to turn your forensic problem into numerical parameters that can be presented to a machine learning algorithm. <coughs> how often do I need to present uh, my example to the machine to remember? If you have a not so, it's like with children. We start easy. Small problem, well, we maybe need to present it only 100 times. Big problem, more complex, 60 features, 100 features, 1,000 features, maybe 10,000 time, uh, uh, 10, times. And performance measures will help us to uh, determine this. What you may, let's say, may recognize slowly, it's not just buying a tool. It's an understanding what is behind in order to be able to pick up and to assess whether your machine could be able to learn at all. This you know. Identification versus verification. Identification is the tra traditional SQL query in the database, give me pattern or give me query with uh, attributes as follows. But what, is, what are we doing if you have no SQL or if you have uh, more um, dynamic parameters? The other one is verification. I usually s took the example of signature verification in typical forensics problem, foren uh, forensic signature analysis, where a forensic expert needs to uh, infer whether two signatures are written by the same person, genuine or forged. How do we teach mach uh, in machine on the parameters and then on the comparison? How many tolerance do we allow? So altogether, uh, there is um, pattern recognition now. This is a 101 um, a process that allows us to systematically describe the different steps. And this is the same as you do in uh, uh, the forensics process, where you have acquisition, pre-processing, analysis, linkage. Similar pre-processing steps uh, exist for machine learning. So there's a nice analogy where you can go between the bad disciplines back and forth. The typical and the most easy examples are related, for instance, um, to template matching. Uh, and here I would say if you have a blueprint from a ship where you don't know and in your uh, records there are other blueprints and you just try uh, to match the wiring or the boundings. This would be template matching, the first one. Structural uh, pattern recognition would be where you describe, for instance, the linkage uh, between individuals or the linkage between connections for phone, uh, phone calls and so on. And the last one uh, is very much uh, where you uh, count the frequency uh, of particular properties uh, and use, let's say, adaptive mechanisms like on our radio to adapt parameters to separate between classes, purely based on statistical properties of the parameters. And then it's going deep. Only for statistical pattern recognition, uh, there's a nice survey paper, it's 2000, uh, from 2000, but it's a classic in the domain. There are nine different methods for feature uh, projection. So many of you may have heard principal component analysis. Well, this is just one of them. Linear discriminant analysis is another one, and there are seven others. 
feature selection methods, seven in the literature, feature selection still an active uh, area of research. Permanently, there are new methods uh, that are, for instance, better optimized, that are not heuristic any longer. Uh, there is something uh, happening. Learning algorithms, classification methods, and then also the fusion of classifier schemes. It's a whole world by itself. And tools one buys may have implemented something for you that is easy, but can you trust that they use the right tools? We hope. What I also like to point out is that all the methods in statistical pattern recognition have been originally implemented uh, for rather simple tasks. Well, 20 years ago, our computers were not so powerful. Maybe IBM mainframes, but who had them or had access to them? Now, uh, with uh, ever increasing computing power, we have the opportunity to have advanced uh, computational methods and data-driven methods because we permanently produce data. And with this, also the type of algorithm needs to change. And the effect that you have been uh, experiences and hearing now everywhere, deep neural network is exactly one effect of this. Another example, what I just like to mention, because it's so popular in the forensic community, everybody <laughs> likes ex a regular expression, everybody uses them, and sometimes I think, oh my God, are they able to encode all the variations that they want to encode? Wouldn't it be nice to make it a machine for us? So, yes, it's possible. State machines uh, are very much able, auto, automata theory and state machines are able to support us. We just need to get our hands dirty and work on it. And then I say, forensics experts don't need to analyze those algorithms, or let's say don't need to develop their algorithms. But it's very fruitful if forensic expert work with computer scientists hand in hand in order to tune those new algorithms to be practical and applicable in the forensic discipline. Theoretical foundations. Something you don't hear usually in commercial products. Ugly duckly theorem. Who was able to write when it was formulated? 96. Ugly duckling theorem is one of the fundamental theorems in machine learning pattern recognition and it says that as long as I have no task at hand or no prior knowledge, all attributes or all features to describe a pattern are equally good. And my example in class is usually if I want to uh, differentiate or to say the other way around. Um, the other way around is it doesn't matter how many uh, or features I put into the pot to do my classification. I need to uh, select uh, features that support my classification task. And the example I give in class is if I try to differentiate male and female there is no point to count arms, fingers, legs, and so on. It is important to get the right features. And now translate this, what does it mean for your malware? What does it mean for intrusion detection? What does it mean for image analysis on your hard drives? <coughs> Which features are those features that support the task? Ugly duckly theorem. And any company does not reveal their features to solve the task should be forbidden to sell their products. The next one, no free lunch theorem. There is not such a thing like a perfect algorithm.
As long as we research, we will not find the algorithm that solves all pattern matching problems. <coughs> it's a mathematical proof by Walbert McCready in 97. For each algorithm, we can create a problem where the algorithm fails. Now translate for forensics. There is no guarantee that nothing slips if you use machine learning in an investigation. Eventually, your features and your classifier are unable to solve the particular task for the particular case you have. If people get tired about Daubot, you need to test, it shall be peer reviewed, there need be standardized data sets. This all becomes even more important if we introduce computing technology and forensic sciences. Because machine learning pattern recognitions are developed and tuned to fulfill a particular task, and a particular task under a particular condition only. And we have to assess under which condition these algorithms work. So if you remember only two things from my presentation, <coughs> ugly duckly and no free lunch, please. Data science. It can be complicated. So data-driven approaches, computational intelligence, soft computing, evolutionary algorithms, neural networks, fuzzy logic. There's a lot of <coughs> more algorithms developed uh, between 80s, 90s, 2000s uh, to deal with the increasing amount of data and to learn from data and adapt to data. And being also more soft in their decision than a, a hard threshold like in statistical uh, pattern recognition. <coughs> And those algorithms are inspired by nature, but by no means try to simulate human nature, like reasoning or decision making. So that's why you will hear from me only computational intelligence and never artificial intelligence. What do we mean between hard computing and soft computing? If we have a decision tree, I mean, this is something everybody can uh, easily follow. Then you have a crisp line to the leaf where you say, this is this type of pattern. If you use fuzzy logic, there you have a fine tuning, you have a function. You have a particular pattern only to some degree and a little bit to the other. With this, we can be smoother on the edges. We can be smoother in our decision making, more fussy. There are more specific challenges when we're dealing with computing and forensic sciences. The first thing, there are many algorithms that struggled with performance and they introduced some randomization in order to find approximations in their solutions, heuristics. <coughs> the typical is, for instance, a random uh, Monte Carlo method where you try to optimization problem just by trial and error. You find a solution eventually, but there's no guarantee that you find exactly the same solution two times. It's a little bit different. How do we deal with this in forensics? Do we go to the judge, oh, I got this result uh, last week. Uh, if I shall run it now, it might be a little bit different. Assume we use heuristic methods for feature selection just by try and error. And we get on two different days at two different times, two different sets of features. Oops. So, careful. 
If you look at algorithms used in forensic sciences, even if it takes longer, take an optimal or deterministic algorithm over an heuristic algorithm, then you know what you get and it's reproducible. Second, outliers versus um, normal. In forensic sciences, we are very much interested into the outliers. Many of the shelf products deal with general characteristics, outliers. So this one data point, this is up there. Ah, yes, nice. We can filter this away. Not in forensics. This may give us the lead. So look into the uh, algorithms uh, or look together with a good data scientist in the algorithms uh, that you get. So there is no filtering out from outliers because those may provide you the indication for your case. Next problem, imbalanced data sets. If we are developing uh, machine learning algorithms or tune for our solving our problems, we need examples. Remember, machine learning, machine learn by, from examples. What do we get? Usually our data sets are very imbalanced. There's a lot of normal traffic and then this is this one uh, incidents. How do we deal with those highly imbalanced data sets? How do we deal with that at the time of distance uh, system design, we don't have available potentially uh, characteristics of an attack? And the last one, and this I mentioned earlier, what are we doing if we use this fancy new deep ne neural network and we are going to present our uh, uh, expert findings in the court of law and we are asked to explain uh, how did you come to your solution. Will you tell the judge and the jury, oh, I have this new deep neural network. It has 1,000 input nodes, it has 10 layers. Each layer has about uh, 100 nodes and then I have these three output nodes. This made my decision. Sorry? Can we translate it in something that is understood by human? Yes, but it costs us some work. Quickly, uh, some highlights on how to challenge this. Uh, whatever I'm telling you now, uh, we have solutions. Uh, but I think this is a work of progress, or a work in progress for everybody, for the whole community. And we need more research and cooperation in order to further improve it. First example uh, related to economic crime investigation. Uh, I talked about mobile money. Uh, there are big telecom providers in Norway who have large data sets in mobile money and they have a huge problem in fraud in mobile money and they give researchers even real data sets to learn from. So what we did is we used analysis by synthesis. We used this one data set that we got. We created a simulation engine uh, to uh, systematically uh, first to understand uh, fraud patterns in the data set, second to systematically create fraud pattern into a clean data set. I mean, it's the same what you would do when you uh, ingest malware in a sandbox environment, same we do with fraud for financial. And, uh, we have established a financial fraud simulator uh, which uh, is uh, open source, publicly available and we are also, for those who are interested, the data sets uh, can be uh, downloaded from Kaggle. Kaggle is a platform for machine learning pattern recognition competitions. Now, uh, we have been, uh, four weeks ago, uh, it's official, we have been received generous funding uh, to establish a national cyber range. Yes, there are cyber ranges. 
usually uh, in the basements, uh, in, uh, in home, uh, homeland security organizations. We received uh, funding uh, to have a smaller cyber range, in particular for research and for cooperation with industry. If we have a cyber range, a real one, then we are able also to produce simulations and those collect evidence and use it for later analysis. And our studies from financial fraud uh, and serious game will very much help us. Stay tuned. <coughs> Another example I like to give is on threat intelligence. Uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, very much uh, to provide intelligence before incidences uh, occur. And for this, uh, create attention uh, also to uh, dark web uh, markets where, for instance, malware samples uh, are traded. And uh, for this, uh, we cooperated uh, with one of the main security providers in Norway who provided us also with data sets. And the objective was, uh, for instance, to establish trends um, uh, and yeah, tra security related trends in dark web forums and what, what is, for instance, where are password databases are traded, uh, where are credentials, uh, other credentials created uh, for service and so on. And without going in the, in the um, let's say, algorithmic details, uh, I like to point out that we were m very much eager to understand the performance of an, on deep learning because everybody talks about it. And we are wondering, is it really so good? And according to no free lunch, we should be able to break it. <laughs> and the message is um, deep neural networks, also if we are using, for instance, pre-collected uh, models uh, from Google, uh, have their, uh, let's say, performance, and this is, now I try whether I find, yes, uh, this is a convolutional neural network, uh, this is the performance, and you see uh, uh, everything uh, has quite a good performance, but then surprisingly, with the right features and a classical uh, support vector machine algorithm, you can achieve quite exactly the same recognition rates. So there is not necessarily to, to need to bring this huge machinery of deep neural network to solve your problems. If you understand your problem, if you're right, you choose the right features and understand the classification task, then also simple algorithm do. Simple, I mean, I left in a time when support vector machine was new and everybody was in the same hype like they are today about deep neural network. It's just a circle going around. So, this is the proof, no free lunch, there is no superior algorithm. Example for threat intelligence, this is an ongoing project where we cooperate uh, with a uh, major security provider in Norway who provides threat intelligence first for the financial sector and then, then it's handed over to federal police and Europol. Dog food, you know what dog food is? One of the major uh, so, uh, soft coders usually know, uh, software engineers know. Um, Dog food is uh, one of the, uh, I, I forgot the name, producers of dog food said, uh, our product is good if you dare to eat, you producer of dog food, if you dare to eat your own dog food. So we use dog food using our own algorithms to support security operations of the whole university. <coughs> the, sec the section from digital security is working closely with us together and we have the opportunity that some uh, of the PhDs are security cleared and can uh, work there and test new algorithms. Last example, uh, malicious code, malware analysis, uh, of course. Um, this is a 
a little bit an older slide uh, only to show you uh, the different approaches, static analysis, dynamic analysis. I mean, this is cookbook information. Um, we have been quite uh, studying intensively dynamic analysis uh, for information-based dependency matching, so where we followed the entire flow. Um, and of course, PDF analysis, because uh, 2012 Norway was uh, under major national attack uh, with uh, infected uh, PDFs. So there our friends uh, from the basement uh, had a huge interest. An example that I picked for now is uh, malware classification, multinominal static analysis in order to identify uh, malware categories and families which is particularly uh, important uh, if you um, look for malware analysts. They don't want to, uh, there are every day uh, millions of samples popping in uh, and they don't want to analyze those malware samples that are known. They want to uh, do the sandboxing of malware samples <coughs> that are unknown. And how can we quickly filter out known malware samples if they have no, uh, let's say, easy signature. And what we used uh, there is, uh, because uh, we have all these obfuscation techniques, uh, is fuzzy logic. And on one hand, to deal uh, with, let's say, approximate uh, matching on the patterns, but also uh, to uh, get rid of crisp, um, hardcore uh, formulation, like, for instance, if you want to warn someone there's a, there's a weight dropping on you, if you tell him there's a, a weight dropping with uh, 105 tons in a velocity of, boom. So you better say, watch out, and he jumps. So, and the same we would like to achieve if we are communicating with lawyers or forensic experts. And uh, there's, uh, according to my knowledge, please tell me if there is something better. One opportunity out there that allows uh, to have the advantage of explorative data analysis with neural networks and the creation of rules that are human understandable. One method that can combine those two advantages, this is NeuroFuzzy. If you use neural networks for statistical data analysis first, and then transfer those, as I said, 1,000 input parameters, 10 times 1,000 hidden layers output creators into rules, if then, malware, if this and this, don't know, benign. Simple, understandable rules. And we used uh, NeuroFuzzy, NeuroFuzzy is uh, was developed in the 90s. Uh, it was quite unpopular because it couldn't uh, compete with algorithms like um, support vector machines, so it was a little bit in decline. But thinking about uh, the problem, forensic needs something human understand. So I thought, let's pull it out again. We know it's not good and let's look what happens. Let's take the algorithm apart. And what we realized uh, is, this I had the combination, and uh, what we realized is that in the uh, transfer from the uh, neural network output to the fuzzy rules, uh, there are some uh, very inaccurate estimations of so-called fuzzy patches. Very machine learning, I don't bother you with this. And just I go one slide. This is uh, the slide. So, and originally we wanted to do something good for forensics to help create algorithms that are human understandable. No algorithm was there, but a badly working neural fuzzy approach known in the literature. And by taking the time and the effort to understand what is going wrong with the algorithm, we found out uh, that those estimation of those, oops, 
uh, of those patches that describe little data clusters was too inaccurate and it could be improved. And by doing the improvement, uh, we are able to provide a completely new uh, methodology to the forensic domain. And yes, we can also combine it, and this I had earlier. Sorry, I'm now uh, running uh, and combine it with all the advantages of deep learning. So there is hope. Uh, to deal with complexity, there are methodologi methodologies uh, to turn complex parameter output into human understandable rules. But still my message is watch out, many things can go wrong and we don't want that, for instance, promising technologies are taken out just because someone didn't know how to apply it correctly. With this, I, uh, I have much more. <laughs> With this, I uh, go to my last slide as a summary, uh, the admission uh, of computational forensics. With computational forensics, we can increase performance uh, in forensic sciences, efficiency and effectiveness. Um, we can uh, provide data sets for benchmarking, for assessment data, and we can uh, implement uh, new methodologies, standardized procedures. My personal dream is to have computers <coughs> as expert witness in the room and being challenged like any other expert. In order to do get there, of course, we need more training, we need better understanding, and we need a uh, cooperation between data scientists and forensic scientists. And I don't think that any hardcore forensic scientists will be replaced by computers. There will be a synergy between the both fields, and both sides can learn from each other. Last but not least, last but not least, uh, introducing computing technology and forensic sciences in great extent requires also a look at the law. Forensics is done with respect to uh, law enforcement. So if we are creating new technology to be used, then the question is what are we doing if a computing mechanism goes wrong? No free lunch ugly duckling, how to deal with this. I hope you are more curious than frustrated and I'm happy to look forward to talking with you. Thank you. <laughs>